Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into this book of Genesis and how great it is. You'll remember that Joseph now has identified himself to his brothers. He was convinced that there was no way they would have sold Benjamin and ran home or any one of the other brothers and even admitted that they felt it was God punishing them for what they had done to their brother Joseph and of course it was Joseph they were talking to. So Joseph being next in charge in Egypt was able to protect his family. You'll remember in the last lecture to bring you up to date Joseph told them whatever you do when I introduce you to Pharaoh tell him that um, you are keepers of the sheep because uh, as it stated, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. That was the last clause. This would guarantee a separation for his family. Now, at the same time, and I will speak again uh, to this question before we finish this lecture today, or at least by the first of the next one, again uh, concerning shepherd kings, and kind of document that yes, it was the southern kingdom that at least the pharaoh of this time, uh, because you're going to find out he owned sheep, and he asked for part of the family to tend his. So documenting that um, Apope was, uh, this particular pharaoh was a shepherd king. Thus, uh, why am I going to that uh, length? Because Joseph married one of the shepherd king's priests, I'm sorry, a shepherd king's priest's daughter. And therefore Ephraim and Manasseh were both of the, were of Adamic stock. That, that's important. And um, we'll follow it along. You have to really analyze for all things are documented in God's word, but sometimes you have to search and really listen to the word to pick up on it. Having been said, chapter 47, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. And then Joseph, who was second in command at this time, came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. They're, I've got them parked over there. They're doing well. Let's see how Pharaoh takes this too. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, that's grace, all right, and uh, presented them unto Pharaoh, verse 3. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, what is your occupation? Basically, this was customary for the area question. And they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. In other words, um, I, I want you to, to uh, expand this out in the futurist sense in your mind because through this line would come the shepherd of all shepherds. That is to say, the chief shepherd, which is Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Verse 4. They said, Moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come. For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And um, Pharaoh's reply, verse 5, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. Six, the land of Egypt is before thee. It's open, it's there. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. So there we have it. See, that being his herds, his... Uh, so... Um, we see that indeed he was a shepherd king. Uh, many of these little hints that come along. Now remember again, Joseph is being set up here as a type of savior. It was Joseph that uh, instructed Pharaoh concerning what would happen in a 14 year period. There would be seven good years whereby they 
put up grain and then seven lean meaning this was a desperation type famine I mean nobody uh, their cattle especially could have lived through it but because of this one Joseph who at the same time is making Pharaoh a very rich person because having all that storage in his warehouse he's bringing monies of the land into the the uh, coffers of uh, Pharaoh verse 7 and Joseph brought in Jacob his father uh, and and uh, he brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh now here when I, I want to I want you to know something when remember God has changed Jacob's name to Israel and when you hear Jacob that term utilized of this father of the patriarchs we're talking there about natural seed that is to say the natural flesh bodies and the tribes of Israel but when God addresses him in his word as Israel his name being so called that's the spiritual seed and um, Jacob in the natural blessed Pharaoh and of course um, why not I mean here um, he, this old man and he's getting on in years here and we're going to cover that in just a second um, had thought from his favorite wife he had lost this boy he now has regained him and not only regained him but the fact that he is second in command of all Egypt and that Almighty God Yahweh has blessed him with an, the knowledge and the vision of the future uh, whereby he has all these grains in store verse 8 and Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? This basically was a custom as well in passing greetings in the East Nine. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers, in the days of their pilgrimage. Now you will note that rather than aged, uh, Jacob uses the terminology pilgrimage. Why? Because they really hadn't yet been blessed with entry into the promised land as God has promised them, though they were in Canaan. And um, actually, it's 215 years from um, Abram's call by Almighty God we would find at this time, perhaps it will help you, that Joseph would be 39 years old at this time. Reuben, the firstborn, would be 46. And Simeon would be 45. Levi, 44. And Judah, through whom Christ would come, 43. So we have the migrations. And, um, of course, Jacob, as stated, getting along in years. Verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. Went back to Goshen, 11. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. In the best, I repeat, the best of the land. In the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And of course, the, the city of Ramesses, of course, was in Goshen. And uh, Ramesses meaning child of the sun. Probably uh, one of the most famous pharaohs named Ramesses. Well, as you continue in Exodus, uh, you learn of him. Verse 12. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. In other words, he took care of them as you might say as, a, as, as if they were a, a child. Hand, I mean, provided everything for them. Again, do not lose fact. Watch the, watch the types that are set forth provided what kind of bread. Let's go one more verse and then I'll say another word on this. Verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land 
for the famine was very sore. It was everywhere. So that the land of Egypt and all, I repeat, all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Now, of course, bread is utilized here, but in the futurist sense, what is the famine for in the end times? And this is important. The famine, as it is written in Amos chapter what? Chapter 8, along about verse 11, that the famine of the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. I mean, you can hear the word of men considerably, but to teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse so that you see the types and examples set forth by our Father whereby you would know what would befall you in the end times. And I will quote 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10 and you'll understand better uh, that these things happened as those examples. So you need to learn from them. But here with Joseph being the type of Savior, certainly Christ is the bread of life. I am the bread. I am the bread of life, uh, he would say, the true Savior. And here you more so see this type, that when this famine came over all the land, that God, working through him, provided the substance that would save not only the Gentile, not only the animals, but naturally Israel, the patriarchs as well, and they were taken care of in some of the best land and each given rations and tended to as though they were children. Verse 14. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So here we have it, the, the um, finances of the land. Joseph has made Pharaoh a very rich man. It would seem strange that much of the money of the final generation is gathered up and goes to the east for oil because there is a famine for oil in these end times, black gold, the black running stuff. And it would seem that um, we Westerners um, like to uh, really guzzle the stuff, that is to say, with our high-powered machines. Verse 15, and when money failed in the land of Egypt, I mean, after all, this was a seven-year drought, and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. We're, we're broke. Um, we, we, we don't have any more money, but why should we die now that we've spent a part of these years, probably about five, uh, and you still have bread left, 16. And Joseph said, give your cattle, and I will give you for your uh, cattle if money fail. In other words, I will give you bread for your cattle. That way, you know, this worked kind of a two-fold thing. They didn't have to feed the cattle anymore and they could keep all the bread for their family. Verse 17. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. In other words, this type, again, saves them for perhaps um, what is important, what is really important is when you go to the Savior. And um, I'm not speaking here in a monetary sense, but I want you to understand that when you go to the Savior, you have to give all of yourself. Will we see such a type? Well, let's check it out. Verse 18. When that year was ended, that went over with, I mean, they're out of cattle and so forth, they came unto him the second year, and um, this would be no doubt the seventh, the final, and said unto him, we will not hide it from my Lord. We're, we're going to tell you the truth. How that our money is spent, our Lord also hath our herds of cattle, 
There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. So here we're going to see that they have to shuck it all down and become bondmen of the type Savior to be saved. And again, the type is absolutely perfect when you translate that in a spiritual sense to understand how it is that God does save through that son who paid the price on the cross that all your problems and sins uh, can be cleansed and forgiven, ransomed by his body on that cross for you. So, uh, to put everything in his hand, to within your very being to love all less than him because he has proved his love for you. We begin to get the basis for a clear and pure salvation even as we see this played out in this example in this type. All right, enough said, verse 19. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land, by us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh and give us seed that um, we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And here we see many things. They trusted this type Savior because he told them. It'll be over with in seven years. This is the seventh year. He said, we will sell ourselves for seed to work Pharaoh's land to start over when it's good next year because they believed that that end would come. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe the end will come for that famine of, from hearing God's word when Christ himself returns at the second advent? We're coming to that time uh, most likely uh, in the generation of the fig tree. That began in the year of our Lord, 1948. So, uh, and we know that when the Savior returns, that on that day, the first day of the millennium, the last day of this dispensation, every knee is going to bow in unison, in agreement. And here we have the agreement. They sold out to the Savior, this type of Savior, with the condition that seed would be given back in the seventh, the eighth year that they could have a new beginning. Uh, again, I must reemphasize that you don't miss it. This documents that they believed the word of Joseph, that it would be over with this particular year. Verse 20. And Joseph bought all, brought all the land, bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them so that the land became Pharaoh's. Verse 21. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. Why? That's where the storages were whereby he could feed them and sustain them. He made them bondmen. They become slaves to the Savior. Again, I emphasize the type. I'll say no more. 22. Only the land of the priest bought he not, for the priest had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Now, in Egypt, um, there is the uh, ruling class, we will say, the hierarchy that um, Pharaoh basically took care of, and many of them were called priests. Uh, but the type, again, is set and cast when you eat, read Ezekiel 44, when Christ does return and we are in that millennium. He speaks concerning the, I don't want to use the term the hierarchy because it's simply the priest of the just, the zadok in the Hebrew tongue, as you will read of. God said, don't give them any portion of land. For I am their inheritance, meaning they own everything. 
uh, wherever they stand because God was their inheritance. Again, a perfect type. God's plan documents and, re and uh, proofs itself in so many ways if you simply take the time to analyze those things that have gone on before for there is nothing new under the sun and that that has been shall be again. And I'm quoting from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 23. Now in this 47th chapter of the book of Genesis, the beginning, then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. We know now that this is the seventh year, the end of the famine, and he's giving them, furnishing that seed as agreed, 24. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for them of your households and for food for your little ones. Now, this would be, I want you to see, I'm going to bring modern times into this. Uh, what is customary today, usually a landowner will furnish the seed and the, the uh, worker of the field will do the planting, the tilling, the labor, and the landowner in modern day gets one third one third of the increase. The um, employee or the worker receives only two thirds. Now one part out of five only to Pharaoh for both the land and, and the seed was very generous. That's the point I want you to see. It certainly, one fifth certainly would not hurt if you own no land and no seed simply for your labor to pay only one-fifth back to the landowner uh, and uh, so forth, that would be a, a very, very um, reasonable uh, charge uh, to, um, to lay upon them. A, a very small tax. All right, well, let's put it that way. Okay, let's continue on. Verse 25. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. They said, That's fair enough. And, and truly it was. Verse 26. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priest only, which became not Pharaoh's. Now, naturally, um, uh, it was to that time or the time of this writing, but um, the shepherd kings, which is southern Egypt, um, the pyramid actually splitting and dividing the line between north and south, 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt. Now remember what I told you, this would mean spiritual, not Jacob, but Israel. In the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And here we see the promise of God. Even while they were in a strange land, God blessing them by putting forth this entire episode uh, of Joseph being kind of a peacock, we'll call him a little bit, but naturally blessed of God that he would fall into the hand of um, his brother and be sold into bondage to set up this wonderful deliverance. And in a sense, you see Christ sold also or betrayed uh, to the enemy that his crucifixion coming to pass and salvation made available for the long famine from the crucifixion to the second advent 
And uh, we see uh, the thing that I'm trying to do here is to get you to see that God's in control. And why do I say that? Because as long as God's in control, you can trust his word. It's going to come to pass as it is written, as the prophets have spoken for the mouth of God, our Father, so it shall be. And as it was in the beginning, in this time, so it shall be at the end in the spiritual sense. Thus I call to your attention at the beginning of verse 27, the name Israel given by God, the prince being translated, that contends with God. Now, um, God being then in control, salvation is made available to not only Israel, but to whomsoever will. And spacious room for both cattle, that is to say your goods, whether whatever business you might be in and so forth, as long as you realize and know that our Father, Almighty God, is in control. You either trust Him, you either have faith in Him, or you don't. Blessings come to those in as much as He is literally, actually, factually in control. Goods and blessings come to those that understand that, that faith it, that is to say that believe it, that know it of a fact. Our Father is in control. It takes understanding and any uh, through, I assure you there had no doubt were many times that Joseph could have just broke down and cried like a baby. The world is against me. God's against me, old Potiphar. His wife tries to grab his jer shirt and jerks it clean off of him, trying to get him to get in bed with her. And I mean, you know, it just make a man cry. Really it would that, that uh, everything goes against him. And naturally being thrown in prison and his own brothers, you know, that would be hurtful for your own brothers to talk about killing you and selling you as a slave. At any time, Joseph could have just probably broke down with depression. I was just like, I'll end it. But God can't use people like that. God placed each and every one of us here for a purpose. You're not just here by accident. You have a purpose and a destiny. You're a child of God. And he has put forth an awesome saving plan. But you have to be mature enough in his word to understand. It's going to happen. Yeah, there will be exactly as he states. And yeah, there will be some bad days. But his promise is that you will always go through them. You need not fret. And if you can look at the complex plan that God put in place to bring this type of Savior or this salvation, I will say, into being and into place, he had to touch thousands of lives, uh, thousands of titles to land, converted and so forth, to get the point made. And for who? For you, whereby you can look upon it and see with understanding that your Father knows what He's doing. And you can trust Him. Even as these people trusted Joseph that he was reporting properly at the end of seven years, hey, it's going to be okay. Well, seven always being the number of spiritual compute, completeness, when you come spiritually in faith and belief to the point that you can understand our Father's overall plan from Genesis through Revelation, then relax and enjoy the blessings of God. Claim them. Live them. And for you are a blessed person indeed when you can take the time to absorb the bread in this starving world at this time, the bread of truth, where so many people are in a daze and a stupa wondering what tomorrow brings. 
as the news breaks forth with all sorts of anxieties and problems to depress and or a, a weak stance at trying to make stand up they all have the most beautiful plan the word of God to suffice them to strengthen them and they try to hang on to man's things rather than their own fathers who's in control so put him in control of your life and follow him be his bondman and God will bless you past uh, your expectations even as he multiplied as it is written in this 27th verse the sons of God okay verse 28 seems like I give a little bit more of a lecture there than certainly I planned perhaps one of you needed it so there you've got it do something with it verse 28 and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years so the whole age of Jacob was 147 years do you know what 17 means uh, in numerics it means victory and when we follow God's plan we have that victory verse 29 and the time drew nigh that Israel must die and he called his son Joseph and said unto him if now I have found grace in thy sight put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me bury me not I pray thee in Egypt in other words I'm, I'm at that point and when I die you carry my bones out of this place and naturally um, this completes the acrostic in the place of burying that even in the past short years there were many people killed at this place where Abraham, Rachel, Isaac, and Leah, and others were, were buried that makes the acrostic Israel. Made him promise, and of course placing the hand on the thigh was uh, the um, swearing by the seed of all time, 30, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place, and he said, I will do as thou hast said. Joseph kept his word for 31. And he said, swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Now, the translation of that is... Um, is very difficult I will give you my opinion and I, I believe it to be accurate or I would not teach it what it really means I have to take you to what a bed was uh, at this time it was what many of you might call a, a mat or a pallet and his staff in his hand he pushed himself up from the bed to a position of uh, probably kneeling no doubt to the east uh, and uh, worshipped our father and thanked him and prayed to him for the blessings that he had brought through his father and his father's father all these blessings God's wonderful word what am I trying to say this old man whom God had blessed so much even in this condition pushed himself up and kneeling on that bed giving thanks to whom it is from that place which all blessings flow from our father have you recently had problems have you recently had a need have you been blessed he's the one you ask and there are so many, many, I, I, I won't even make an estimate of uh, percentages of people that will ask and once they're blessed, whether they recognize it's from God, they, don't, they won't thank Him. And, and what you do is when you allow yourself to be brought to a low place and you cry out to God, 
And the moment God blesses you, you say, well, that was just a coincidence. He blesses you and gets you out of your trouble and you become a good time Charlie. And do you know what happens to your blessings? The Almighty God takes the big scissors and snips off your blessings and you're on your own again. So always take the examples. These lives were brought forth as an example whereby you know what to do. So never, never let a blessing go by that you do not thank your father for it or forget it. You won't receive any more until you bring yourself to the bottom of the pit and start screaming out for mercy again. Why, why do you enjoy being in, in that pit? Then thank him daily, if nothing else, for the very air you breathe. It belongs to him. All right, enough said. Uh, don't miss the next lecture. Uh, listen a moment, won't you please?